For the past two weeks, we have unpacked Paul's great intercession for the Ephesian saints in which he thanks God for their evident conversion demonstrated by their faith in the Lord Jesus and their love for all the saints. And he describes his unceasing prayer that God would give to them the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, that the eyes of their hearts might be enlightened, that they might know. That is, that they might have an experiential consciousness of the hope of God's calling, of the glorious inheritance, the glorious riches of his inheritance among the saints and the immeasurable greatness of God's power at work for those who believe. Paul then expounds upon this immeasurably great power by describing it in four ways. How great is God's power toward the saints? Well, it is the same power that raised Christ from the dead. Verse 20, the first half of the verse. It is the same power that exalted Christ to the right hand of the majesty on high. Second half of verse 20. It is the same power that forever subjected the demonic powers to Christ. Verses 21 and 22. And it is the same power that united and still unites the church to Christ. Verse 23. And though we are moving on into chapter two today, I'm still chewing on this idea of experiential knowledge. And that led me on Tuesday evening whilst doing the dishes to pull up John Piper's 2010 sermon on Ephesians 1, 15 to 23. I linked it to our Facebook account. I was so moved by the sermon. As I listened, I had three thoughts that have relevance for what I'm gonna say this morning out of Ephesians 2, 1 through 5. The first is that This is indeed experiential knowledge for which Paul prays. We're not off track on that point. Paul's not praying that the Ephesian saints would merely apprehend new information, although I would expect that many of us would learn new truths as we delve deeper into God's calling of us, God's inheritance among us, God's power toward us. But the knowledge of which Paul speaks is more than the bare accumulation of more facts in my brain. It is tasting and enjoying these realities as true for me within the depths of my soul. In that sermon, Piper repeatedly stated that, quote, Paul is praying that we would know with the knowledge of conscious experience. So I felt confirmed in my assertion that what Paul is praying for and what we ought to pursue is the experiential knowledge of God's calling of us, of God's inheritance among us, and of God's power at work toward us. Second, I felt confirmed in my approach to the pursuit of this experiential knowledge. I've been asserting over the past two weeks that Such experiential knowledge is a sovereign gift of God. It is neither compelled by human merit nor constrained by human will. In other words, you cannot make it happen. The wind blows where it wills, John 3, 8. I get this from the fact that Paul prays for them. He can't make it happen for them and neither can they make it happen for themselves and you can't make it happen for yourself. But he does pray which tells me that this experiential knowledge can and ought to be pursued and pursued unceasingly as Paul prayed for them. But Piper pointed out, Paul does not only pray for them, he preaches to them, so to speak. He writes down the content of his prayer. He doesn't have to do that. He could have just prayed for them, but he writes down what he's praying for them. And he expounds upon it. Why does he do that? Evidently, it's because he believes that by getting the Ephesian saints to think about God's calling of them, about God's inheritance among them, about God's power at work toward them, that they might come to know and experience the calling, the inheritance, the power, taste the reality of these things. Yes, the wind blows where it wills, but the wind of the Spirit blows most often through the means of grace. 
the enlightening of the eyes of the heart to behold the glory of God occurs most often when the eyes of the head are beholding the word wherein that glory is revealed. Praying that God would open the eyes of your heart to behold wondrous things in his word, Psalm 119, 18. That prayer only has a chance of being effective if you then open your Bible and look into the word. You might open your Bible, read the word, and feel nothing. That happens all too often. The Spirit is sovereign. You cannot control Him. But if you do not open your Bible and read the word, you are certain to feel nothing. So if you would be experientially conscious of God's calling of you, of God's inheritance among you, of God's power toward you, then prayerfully give yourself to the reading, the hearing, the studying, the meditating upon his calling, his inheritance, and his power. I'm not preaching this morning in order that you might learn more theology. I'm preaching in order that you might learn more about who God is and what God has done in Christ, and that as you learn more theology, you may taste, enjoy, delight, experience the glory of these truths. Third, as I listened to Piper preach the end of Ephesians 1, I was listening against the backdrop of the study I had already started on Ephesians 2, and I began to see the connection between the two passages. Ephesians 2, 1 to 7 is a description of the immeasurable greatness of God's power toward us who believe. If you were wondering as you read that in chapter 1, what that power looks like in actual, personal, lived experience, this passage in Ephesians 2 explains it for you. I want you to note the connections between the two texts. I see five. Paul wants us to know the hope of God's calling, 118. Paul then describes God's effectual call in 2, 4 to 5. Paul wants us to know the riches of God's glorious inheritance in the saints, 119. Paul then speaks of the immeasurable riches of God's grace and kindness that God will show to us in Christ throughout the coming ages, 2, 7. God raised Christ from the dead by the working of that immeasurable power. Verses 19 and 20 of chapter one. God raised us from the dead with Christ by that same power. Chapter two and verse six. God seated Christ at his right hand in the heavenly places. Chapter one and verse 20. God has seated us with Christ in the heavenly places. Chapter two and verse six. God has subjected all evil, all demonic authority to Christ. Chapter 1 and verse 21, God has delivered us from all evil, demonic authority and bondage. Chapter 2 and verse 2. So Paul wants the Ephesian saints to know, to feel, to taste, to enjoy, to wander at, being called by God, being an heir of God and being the object of God's sovereign, life-giving, death-destroying, demon-subjecting, sin-conquering power. And to that end, he prays for them unceasingly, but also to that end, he teaches them about these saving works and how they have experienced and are experiencing them, even while they remain unaware. And I too want that. I want us to know in the way that Paul is speaking. I want us to feel, to taste, to enjoy, to wander at being called by God, being made an heir of God and being the object of God's saving power. And to that end, I have prayed and I am praying even as I am preaching this text And I invite you to do the same. While I preach, I invite you to pray that God would be pleased 
to give us the spirit of wisdom and of revelation and the knowledge of him, that the eyes of our hearts might be enlightened, that our souls might be flooded with joy at what God has done and at what God is doing and what God will do in us and for us that this joy may then overflow our souls in transforming power, touching every area of our lives, our marriages, our families, our jobs, our pursuits, our pastimes, everything. And I am praying and preaching to this end that those among us this morning who know nothing of this call, this inheritance, and this power would experience it today that the dead bones of your soul this morning would feel and experience the wind of God's breath, God's spirit blowing upon them, raising them up, knitting them together and making a new creation in Christ. In other words, while I tell the saints what God has done in raising them from death to life and in uniting them to Christ and in making them heirs of the immeasurable riches of grace and kindness. I'm also praying that God would exert his immeasurable life-giving, death-destroying, demon-subjecting, sin-conquering power towards you, unbeliever, that you would walk out of here this morning entirely different than you came in probably not knowing for sure what happened. I'm praying that if you came in dead, you'll walk out alive. In verses one to three, the apostle Paul describes the condition of man apart from God's call. Apart from the exercise of God's immeasurable power toward us. So if you would know, if you would appreciate, if you would experience the wonder, the joy of being called, of being converted, You need to recognize the condition out of which God called you by his immeasurable power. Paul's point here is that it took immeasurably great power to bring you to faith in Jesus. I don't care whether you were five when you were born again. Hearing your mom or your dad read the Bible in your living room or whether you were 55 in a chapel service in a prison somewhere. The same immeasurably great power is at work in raising the dead to life. Paul describes this state first as one of spiritual death. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins. What does it mean to be spiritually dead? Well, humanity is composed of two essential elements, material and immaterial, body and soul, flesh and spirit. The soul is not different from the spirit. The two are used interchangeably throughout scripture. It is evident that natural man, though dead in trespasses and sins, is still very much spiritually active in the sense that his spirit, his soul, his mind, all synonyms are still functioning. He still thinks and feels, he still loves and hates, he still sins and schemes, he still worships and prays, he still makes moral judgments. Natural man still has, in the words of the Baptist confession, a reasonable and immortal soul that will live on past the death of the body to face the just and everlasting wrath of God. In other words, spiritually dead does not mean spiritually inactive. Natural man is quite spiritual. Paul told the Athenian pagans in Acts 17, 22, I perceive that you are in every way very religious. And you may be very religious this morning and dead in trespasses and sins. All this spiritual activity, however, is directed toward one end, namely sin. Natural man is, to borrow a phrase from the late great John Gerstner, spiritual zombies, hence the title of this sermon. 
These spiritual zombies are very much active, but they are active only in sin. They are driven by an unreasoning, unthinking impulse to gratify the passions of the flesh, to indulge the desires of the body and of the mind. So if spiritually dead does not mean spiritually inactive, then what does it mean? Well, in scripture, it means two interrelated truths. First, to be spiritually dead means to be spiritually unresponsive to God. That is unable to respond to God in faith and repentance. The Bible repeatedly refers to the spiritual incapacity of natural man. For instance, in John 6, Jesus tells the crowd of Galilean Jews, no man can come to me unless the father who sent me draws or calls him and I will raise him up on the last day. Then when the crowds reject Jesus and they turn away from them, he explains their departure in terms of that inability to respond to the gospel apart from the effectual working of God. John 6, 65, he said, in, in response to their departure, this is why I told you, no one can come to me unless it has been granted him by the Father. Paul speaks of the same spiritual unresponsiveness of the natural man in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, the natural person. That's the person apart from the spiritual life granted by God in the effectual call. The natural person does not accept this, the things of the Spirit of God. They are folly to him. Well, why? Because they are not able to understand them because they're spiritually discerned and the natural man is devoid of the spirit. The context makes plain that this inability to understand spiritual truth is not owing to a natural deficiency in mental capacity. It's not that the natural man cannot comprehend what the gospel says. It's rather that he cannot see in the gospel anything but foolishness or offensiveness or irrelevance. In 2 Corinthians 4, Paul describes the spiritual inability in terms of a sinful blindness that results in part from Satan's deception. He says, even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. To be spiritually dead is to be spiritually blind, to, to look at the gospel and, and be unable to see any glory, anything compelling, anything deserving or demanding my faith and my submission. It is to be spiritually blind, unable to see the glory of Christ in the gospel, spiritually ignorant, unable to comprehend the truth of the gospel, and therefore spiritually disabled, unable to come to faith in, or to come to Christ rather in faith and repentance. But inability is not the whole of the story. If it were, there would be some credence to the charge of injustice in God for condemning those for unbelief who cannot believe. It would be cruel to condemn a paraplegic for not walking or an infant for not understanding quantum physics. Both of those, however, are examples of natural inabilities. Spiritual inability is not a natural inability. It is a moral inability. And that's what makes natural man culpable for his sin and unbelief. Natural man is unable to respond to God in faith and repentance because he is unwilling to respond to God in faith and repentance. There is nothing external preventing him from coming to Jesus. There's nothing external preventing him from walking the narrow way that leads to life. The only hindrance is his own love of evil and darkness. And it is this love of evil and darkness that renders the gospel foolishness or irrelevant or offensive in his eyes. And the love of evil and darkness is a morally culpable thing. 
Therefore, second, to be spiritually dead means to be morally opposed to God. That is unwilling to respond to God in faith and repentance. This is how Jesus explained unbelief in John chapter three. He says, it's a love of darkness. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and the people loved darkness rather than light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light lest his works should be exposed. So why do sinners refuse to come to the light of Christ? It's because they hate the light. Why do they hate the light? Because they love the darkness and the deeds of darkness. And the love of darkness and its deeds is a wickedness worthy of judgment. Second, not only were we dead before God exercised his immeasurable power toward us, we were captives. Captive to what? Well, Paul lists three tyrants who hold men in bondage, the world, the devil, and the flesh. The first tyrant is the world, he says, in which which you once walked following the course of this world. Literally, Paul says that we once walked according to the age of this world, which is a combination of two related New Testament thoughts. The New Testament uses the word age to refer to this present age in which fallen humanity is engaged in active rebellion against God and fallen creation groans beneath the curse. And the New Testament uses the word world to refer to the value system or the worldview by which fallen humanity operates. John Stott helps us to think about this when he writes, it, that is the world, permeates, indeed dominates non-Christian society and holds people in captivity. Wherever human beings are being dehumanized by political oppression or bureaucratic tyranny, by an outlook that is secular, repudiating God, amoral, repudiating moral absolutes or materialistic, glorifying the consumer market, by poverty, hunger, or unemployment, by racial discrimination or any form of injustice, there we can detect the subhuman values of this age and this world. Their influence is pervasive. People tend not to have a mind of their own, but to surrender to the pop culture of television. He wrote 40 years ago, so I inserted, or TikTok. And the glossy magazines, or Instagram. It is cultural bondage. And we're just carried along by the spirit of this age, the course of this world. The age of this world looks different in its particulars from culture to culture, but in every age and in every culture, it is a value system driven by greed, by lust, and by pride. 1 John 2, 16, desire of the flesh, desire of the eyes, pride of life. And it holds us in utter bondage until God exerts his immeasurably great power toward us. The second tyrant is the devil. Following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. The prince of the power of the air is Satan, elsewhere in scripture called the ruler of this world, John 12, 31 and 14, 30, the God of this world, 2 Corinthians 4, 4. The air is the spiritual realm in which the demonic powers operate. Those demonic powers that Paul said in 121, all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named have been subjected to the risen and ascended and enthroned Christ. Satan is the ruler over all of those powers. Revelation 9, 11. And Satan is the ruler of the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. And I would say because the spirit is in the singular, we should probably understand this as an impersonal force that animates and energizes the sons of disobedience according to the will of him who rules it, namely Satan. In other words, Satan holds the natural man captive, not by making them all conscious devil worshipers, but by animating and energizing them to walk according to the course of this world. 
Think about that the next time you can't seem to stop scrolling Facebook or binge watching Netflix. The third tyrant is the flesh, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. And note carefully the way Paul states this. First, he speaks of the passions of our flesh. And here, flesh doesn't refer to our physical bodies, that which you can see and touch. But as so often in Paul's writings, he's speaking of the sinful nature of man. It's the same way he speaks of it in Romans 8, 12 to 13, Galatians 5, 16 to 24. This makes the passions of the flesh, not the natural desires of our physical bodies, but the sinful desires of our fallen nature. And the reason for, the reason this is important is twofold. First, it guards us from the error that many Christians over the ages have fallen into, the error of regarding every bodily desire as sinful. God created us as physical beings with physical desires. Our fallen sinful nature, however, have taken these natural desires and have twisted them, perverted them beyond their ordained bounds. Again, Stott is helpful when he says, there's nothing wrong with natural body, bodily desires, whether for food or sleep or sex. For God has made the human body that way. It is only when the appetite for food becomes gluttony, for sleep, sloth, for sex, lust, and immorality, that natural desires have been perverted into sinful desires. But second, this distinction is important because it guards us from thinking of sin only in terms of physical acts. For Paul goes on after he says the passions of the flesh regarding to the sinful nature, not the physical body, the sinful nature. He goes on then to speak of the two constituent parts of man, the body and the mind. Bitterness, unforgiveness, self-pity, selfishness, greed, pride, fear, lust. These invisible, non-physical Sins hold men in bondage long before they break forth out of the mind into physical acts of vengeance, extortion, theft, deceit, cowardice, and immorality. In fact, Stott reminds us according to Philippians 3, 3 through 6, the passions of the flesh can even manifest themselves in self-righteousness and religious works. This final chapter is a reminder that we do not need the world or the devil to hold us in bondage. Our own perverse passions are perfectly capable of making us dance like puppets on a string all the way to destruction and damnation. Finally, Paul describes the condition of natural man as one under condemnation and the wrath of God. We were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. There are three important affirmations in this final phrase that need to be unpacked. First, in our natural condition, we are subject to God's righteous wrath. The wrath of God is the response of divine holiness to moral evil. It is God's personal, emotional, if I can use the phrase, hatred of sin and his righteous determination to respond to sinners in retributive justice. J.I. Packer writes in his classic work, Knowing God, that God's wrath in the Bible is never the capricious, self-indulgent, irritable, morally ignoble thing that human anger so often is. It is instead a right and necessary reaction to objective moral evil. God is only angry where anger is called for. Even among humans, there is such a thing as righteous indignation, though it is perhaps rarely found. But all God's indignation is righteous. Would a God, Packer asks, who took as much pleasure in evil as he does in good be a good God? Would a God who did not react adversely to evil in his world be morally perfect? Surely not. But it is precisely this adverse reaction to evil, which is a necessary part of his moral perfection that the Bible has in view when it speaks of God's wrath. And yet people are so skittish of this doctrine. 
This wrath, according to the apostle Paul, is revealed even now in God's giving sinners over to the destructive and ruinous passions of their flesh, Romans 1, 18 to 32. And this righteous wrath will be revealed on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment is revealed, Romans 2, 5, when God condemns sinners to the everlasting expression of his wrath in hell. Packer goes on to stress that the retributive justice that flows from God's wrath is not, not one whit more or less than what strict justice deserves. He says, if it be asked, can disobedience to our creator really deserve great and grievous punishment? Anyone who has ever been convicted of sin knows beyond any shadow of doubt that the answer is yes. And he knows too that those whose consciences have not yet been awakened to consider, as Anselm put it, how weighty is sin are not yet qualified to give an opinion. Man in his natural condition then is the focus of God's anger and the object of his strict justice. Second, this is a condition in which man exists by nature, Paul says. By nature would be the opposite of by choice. In other words, condemnation, according to Paul, is an inherited condition. The best commentary on what Paul says in Ephesians 2, 3 can be found in Romans 5, 18 to 19, where Paul says, therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. So by one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. And I understand these two verses to be affirming two separate inheritances. Verse 18 declares that Adam's trespass brought condemnation and death to all who are covenantally united to him by natural birth, all mankind while Christ's righteousness brings justification and life to all who are covenantally united to him by a new spiritual birth. In other words, verse 18 affirms inherited, or we might call it imputed condemnation through Adam and inherited or imputed justification through Christ. Now note that the relation that obtains between the act and the result must be the same in both halves of this verse. And we know from the second half of verse 18 that Christ's righteousness brings justification and life to us by its own virtue. It has no reference to our works whatsoever. Romans 3.28, Galatians 2.16. It follows of necessity then that in the first half of verse 18, Adam's unrighteousness must bring condemnation to us of its own accord, equally without reference to our own works. Inherited condemnation. Verse 19 then declares that through Adam's disobedience, all who are covenantally united to him by natural birth are actually made sinners. While through Christ's obedience, all who are covenantally united to him by new birth are actually made righteous. In other words, verse 19 affirms inherited corruption through Adam and inherited sanctification through Christ. So what does man inherit from Adam that places him under God's wrath? He inherits condemnation and guilt, verse 18a, and he inherits corruption and a sin nature, verse 19a. And lest anyone be tempted here this morning to complain that it's somehow unfair to be condemned for Adam's sins and for those acts committed out of a corrupt nature inherited from Adam, I would remind you that the same covenantal mechanism obtains for the way that sinners inherit Christ's righteousness leading to justification and a new nature leading to sanctification. Third, note that this is a universal condition of all men without exception. And this is evident three times in verse three. Paul says, among whom we all 
once lived, all of us without exception, and were by nature children of wrath, by nature, by inheritance from Adam, before any of us had done anything, either good or evil, we were born into this world under condemnation. Even as the rest of mankind, in other words, there is no difference, there are no exceptions. Stott writes, it is a failure to recognize this gravity of the human condition which explains people's naive faith in superficial remedies. Universal education is highly desirable. So are just laws administered with justice. Both are pleasing to God, who is the creator and righteous judge of all mankind. But neither education nor legislation can rescue human beings from spiritual death, captivity, or condemnation. A radical disease requires a radical remedy. The condition of mankind described by Paul in this passage is one of utter helplessness and hopelessness. Every which way we turn, we're confronted with a dead end of impossibility. We say, if, if man would just stop sinning and repent and return to God, he would find God merciful. But man cannot, because he is spiritually dead, unable and unwilling to repent and return and be reconciled to God. The world, the flesh, and the devil conspire against him to hold him in bondage to his destructive passions. And even if he could and would repent, there stands the insuperable problem of God's righteous wrath, which ceaselessly calls for his condemnation and which will not be satisfied with anything less than strict retributive justice. Man is utterly powerless to save himself. If you are here this morning outside of Christ, you have no power in you, none. There is no hope in you not in works, not in merit, none. So is there any hope for sinners? Look at the next two words of verse four. But God. Paul declares that while there is no hope in sinners, there is a God who is rich in mercy, great in love and abundant in grace, who is willing to save sinners. And God is a God of immeasurably great power who is able to overcome every hurdle to our salvation, spiritual death, captivity to the world, the flesh and the devil, and even our own sinful hearts. He is even able to overcome the hurdle faced by his own righteous wrath. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. In the time that remains this morning, let's just bask in the immeasurably great power that God has exerted toward us in bringing us from wrath to blessing and from death to life. How has God exerted his immeasurably great power toward us? First, by securing for us a perfect redemption. Paul does not explicitly mention this powerful work of redemption in this text, but he did back in Ephesians 1, 7, where he said that in him, in Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. But the work of redemption is implied in this text in two ways. First, by reference to God's wrath in verse three, and second, by the mention of God's mercy in verse four. The justice of God, which flows out of his wrath towards sinners, presents an insurmountable barrier to our salvation. Let's go back to Romans 5, 18 to 19. Just keep this on the screen for a while. Romans 5, 18 to 19. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so by one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. As we saw a moment ago, these verses slam the door of all attempts at reconciliation by means of human effort. 
Paul declares that we were born into a state of condemnation, not by any sin that we had committed, but by the trespass of Adam. When God created man, he structured his relationship to humanity in terms of a covenant with Adam acting, appointed as the covenant representative. If Adam would live before God in faithful obedience, in righteousness, signified by not eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, then he and all of his posterity would be glorified to enjoy the everlasting blessing in the presence of God. Turned, signified rather, by eating from the tree of life. However, if Adam turned from the obedience of faith, turned from the way of righteousness, and sought to become like God, knowing good and evil for himself rather than trusting God for that knowledge, signified by eating from that forbidden tree, then death, spiritual, physical, and eternal would be his inheritance and that of his posterity. And man would dwell in everlasting ruin under the curse of God's wrath, signified by being cut off from the tree of life. Adam trespassed that command He ate from the forbidden tree. He grasped for that sovereignty that belongs to God alone. And the condemning sentence of God came thundering down upon him and upon all his children. We are thus born into this world condemned already. That's what the first half of verse 18 is affirming. But not only have we inherited condemnation from Adam, we have compounded our condemnation by the iniquity that we commit every moment of every day. For we not only inherited from Adam condemnation, we inherited the corruption of our nature. That's the first half of verse 19. We were made sinners by his disobedience. Now, every intention of the thoughts of our hearts are only evil continually. And this is the reason God will remain angry with sinners forever. Not only is sin against an infinitely glorious God worthy of infinite and everlasting wrath, but throughout endless ages in hell, sinners will continue to be wicked and evil, even more so than they are now when God's restraining hand of common grace is removed. So whether by virtue of inherited condemnation, verse 18, or inherited corruption, verse 19, by which we compound our condemnation every moment of every day, there is no hope for Adam's seed from within Adam's race. But God, out of the rich and unsearchable depths of his mercy and motivated by fathomless sovereign love, which he freely set upon us in eternity past, he did for us what it was impossible for us to do for ourselves. He sent his eternally begotten son to become incarnate from outside to become incarnate within Adam's helpless race. And empowered by the eternal spirit, he accomplished what Adam failed to do. He lived in the obedience of faith. He walked in righteousness before God. And this life of obedient, faithful righteousness led to one climactic moment in which the fate of all mankind hung in the balance. You remember that in the Garden of Eden, Adam had said, not thy will, but my will be done. And all of humanity was plunged into death and ruin. In the garden of Gethsemane, Jesus Christ, the second Adam said, not my will, but thy will be done. And a new humanity was redeemed from that ruin to everlasting life. That one act of righteousness that Paul mentions is Christ's obedience unto death, even the death of the cross. And by that act, his elect people were objectively justified in the sight of God and made heirs of everlasting life and blessing. So in the first Adam, humanity inherits condemnation leading to death. But in the second Adam, a new humanity inherits justification leading to life. And because of the work of redemption, Being complete, God raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places and subjected all of his and our enemies under his feet. So this morning, behold, prayerfully behold the immeasurable greatness of God's power toward us who believe. 
manifested in the incarnation of Christ, the inspiration of Christ, the humiliation of Christ, the crucifixion of Christ, the resurrection of Christ, the ascension of Christ, and the limitless and endless sovereignty of Christ. Look upon Jesus in the manger. Look upon him in his baptism. Look upon him in the garden. Look upon him on the cross. Look as as he is risen from an empty grave and seated upon the throne on high and behold the immeasurably great power of God at work toward you. There is nothing, no enemy of your everlasting salvation that is not beneath his feet. The world, the flesh, and the devil even death itself are subject to his everlasting sovereignty. But the immeasurably great power of God is not only exerted in Christ's redemption of his people, it is also exerted in the regeneration of his people. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. We're gonna come back and look at verses four to seven in detail next week. This morning, I wanna just briefly touch upon that phrase, he made us alive. The answer to spiritual death is spiritual life. Christ's work of redemption on the cross would remain objective and outside of us did he not also perform his work of regeneration within us. So I want to close by returning to that passage that we read earlier when we were speaking about spiritual death in terms of man's inability to respond to God in faith and repentance. I want to return to 2 Corinthians chapter 4 where Paul says, even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. This is a description of spiritual death compounded with satanic blindness. And it is the state of all men by nature, without exception, apart from the regenerating power of God. When the glory of Christ in the gospel is presented before the eyes of men's hearts, the beauty and the wonder of his person, the glory and the perfection and the wisdom of his redeeming work. They don't see glory. There are some of you here today and you don't see glory. And this is why you're dead and blind. You regard Christ and his cross as foolishness or offensive or irrelevant and boring. You ignore him, you reject him, you yawn and glance at your watch and check your phone and wonder when this sermon's gonna be over so you can get on with all of the things that you would rather be doing than being here. Infinite glory is presented before your eyes and you don't see it. And you don't see it because you cannot see it and you cannot see it because you don't want to see it because of how it makes you feel. That's the state of some of you this morning. But God, out of the riches of his mercy because of the great love with which he loves us, he sovereignly intervenes and interposes with immeasurable power. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. Paul changes neither his message nor his methods in the face of such overwhelming spiritual deadness and satanic blindness. He just keeps right on preaching Christ as Lord and serving people in Jesus' name. And as he does, watch it, the wind begins to blow. God begins to exert his immeasurable power towards sinners. And the God who said, let light shine out of darkness, shines in hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The immeasurable power that God exerted when he spoke into the vast darkness and said, let there be light, and whole galaxies of burning splendor burst forth in a second. That same power he exerts in regeneration. 
He speaks into the darkness of a human soul and says, let there be light. And the light of the Holy Spirit bursts a flame. And and in the light of that flame and in the heat of that flame, the satanic veil over their eyes disintegrates in an instant. And the human soul erupts with life and energy. And the eyes of man's heart, which a moment ago saw nothing glorious in Christ and nothing compelling in his cross, suddenly sees in the face of the incarnate Christ the very glory of God. And in the cross of Christ, the very wisdom and power of God to save sinners. And from this new life flows inevitably and always faith and repentance in reflexive response. That is regeneration. It is the immeasurable greatness of the power of God to overcome spiritual deadness and satanic blindness, to overcome unbelief and rebellion, and to bring a sinner irresistibly and powerfully to faith and repentance in Jesus. That same power that called forth galaxies, that same power that raised Christ Jesus from the dead is at work in the creation of Christians. And the question of the day is, do you know it? Have you experienced it? Do you see in Christ the very glory of God and in his cross the very wisdom and power of God to save? And if the answer is yes, in the gospel, I see the glory of God. In the cross, I see the wisdom and the power of God. This is my hope. You've known what it is to be called. And you've known what it is to be made alive. You have known the immeasurably great power of God at work towards you. Otherwise, you would see nothing. So even if your regeneration was more like a gently flowing breeze than the force of a hydrogen bomb, you have been the recipient of immeasurable power exerted towards your salvation. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, my aim this morning was twofold. I wanted those who look upon Christ in the gospel and they see glory and they find their hope and they they love him and they trust him. I wanted them to know what immeasurable power you exerted to make that happen. So that they would feel loved, that they would feel gratitude, that they would find worship erupting out of their souls. And I prayed that those who came in here seeing no glory, finding in Christ nothing compelling, having no hope and without God in the world, the walking dead. I pray that as I have preached, you have called. Let there be light. And they see. And they believe. And they are compelled internally to come to Christ and to give him their lives. Would you do that amongst us this morning? And while you are praying for that to happen, if that's you, I want to encourage you to go visit our pastors at the conclusion of this service. Over to my right, your left. They would love to tell you what the first steps of following Jesus are. Now that you've been called, how do you walk? Go tell them, and they'll help you understand what has happened to you. For the rest of us, may great joy erupt within our hearts at what you have done and the immeasurable greatness of your power that you exerted towards us. Thank God we're alive. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.